What is science? That's a big oh, oh, question. I know. Yes, Sterling? Yeah, isn't science just that stuff done by old white dudes with beards and lab coats? Yeah, you know, you'd think so. If you kind of look at a picture book of the history of who's who in science, you'd think it was a prerequisite to do science that you had to be old, white, European, and had a long beard. But that's not really the case. Anybody can do science. It's an unfortunate aspect of the history of science that it is dominated by just such a, a small demographic group. I think that's changing quite a bit, maybe a little more slowly than you'd like, but kind of like a lot of aspects of our world, uh, it just has a history of sexism and racism and all kinds of other isms in there. But I think you'll find that science is becoming increasingly democratic, international, and really accessible to more and more people. At least I hope it's moving in that direction. Now some of that perception, I'd say, is driven partly by our definition of the word. And it's a fairly narrow Western definition. I would argue that people have always been doing science. Everywhere in the world, kind of ever since humans have existed, we've been doing science, studying the world in one way or another. So let's take a look at what we mean by science. My best definition is that it is an empirical study of the natural world and the knowledge that we've accumulated from that study. So it's weird. It's both a noun and a verb, right? It's kind of how you study the world, the action of doing that, scientific method and all that sort of stuff, and the knowledge that you've accumulated. You know, all these books of scientific knowledge are part of science. So both the knowledge and the methods. So people have always studied the world around them, just partly because we're curious creatures by nature, also because we want to know what's coming next. You know, when is the sun gonna rise? When is it gonna be spring? When should I plant my crops? Those questions have always driven people to figure out the world around them. And that's what I mean in terms of people have always been doing science. But one of the cultures that really kind of started the, the formal science, I mean, science, you know, that kind of science, were the Greeks. And so in ancient Greece, people started thinking along this more formal lines and separating the spiritual world from the natural world. And they're the ones with kind of the most written records, which is why they kind of dominate a really formal science, again, you know, kind of a science type of stuff, didn't necessarily crystallize until about the mid 1800s. So it's a pretty recent thing in the sense that we think of it. Science itself is a limited scope of study. And I'll demonstrate it this way. So let's say this entire screen represents reality. And the part inside the circle is the part of the world that is the natural world. So there are things outside of the natural world that are also real. Things like aesthetics, religion, ethics, maybe even magic. So depending on your opinions, you might think that these things are real or imaginary, but I think most people would consider these things real to one extent or another, but they're not governed or part of the natural world. They're not governed by natural laws. So what are natural laws? They're things like gravity or laws of motion or conservation of energy. So those are the rules that govern the natural world. So you might think of natural laws as the rules and they govern what is in nature, the sort of physical reality, which would be composed of things like matter and energy. So these are the boundaries of science. Science can't really escape the natural world. We study natural laws and we study matter and energy. That's it. We can't really say from a scientific standpoint if something is beautiful. Now, you might take aesthetics and bring it into and comment about the natural world and say, you know, all that matter 
uh, composed in a painting is beautiful, but scientists can't go the other way. So really, science is fairly limited. It is a limited view of the world. We've restricted ourselves to just the natural world. Yeah, so what about my poli sci class? Yeah, that's a good question, Sharon Thing. Your poli sci class is one of the social sciences, and they're pretty similar to natural science, the, the chemistry, physics, biology that we've been talking about before, in that they follow the same rules, the same operating procedures, scientific method, that sort of thing. But instead of studying the world governed just by natural laws, they kind of assume that social laws are also predictable, that they have sort of this order to them and that people act in predictable ways. So that's the similarity, but for this class, we'll really talk about natural sciences. Later in a different video, I'll address more about the scientific method, experimental design, things like that. This one is really more for setting the ground rules, the overall structure of how science is basically done. You know, the scientific method is usually the first thing that comes to people's mind, but it doesn't really make something science. You could do the scientific method on something that doesn't have to do with natural laws or the physical world, and it really isn't science because that's the boundaries, right? And the other thing to keep in mind as we move on to some of the properties of good science is science is an interesting tension between skepticism and being open-minded. And that makes it a challenging sort of worldview and perspective to have, but I think a rewarding one. So let's describe some of the characteristics of good science, or the ground rules for doing science. Well, we talked quite a bit before about focus on the natural world. It needs to deal with natural laws, physical matter, things like that. That leads a lot to this idea of testable ideas. We have to put something to the test in science. That's obviously if it's not descriptive science. So testable ideas, they need to be part of the natural world, right? You need to be able to measure it in some way. We can't measure how good somebody is or anything about the spiritual world. We don't have devices for measuring spirituality or goodness or anything like that. Gather empirical data. So early on with the definition, I talked a lot about the word empirical. Important word. It's a couple things it doesn't mean. It doesn't exactly mean objective and it doesn't mean that it's right. I mean, kind of one of the unfortunate, I think, mindsets of many practicing scientists is just that science is always right. And some people are this way too, a little too trusting of science. Remember that skepticism is important. But being empirical doesn't mean that it's right, although there's a better chance that it is. Um, and it doesn't mean it's purely objective. Now, we do try to avoid subjectivity, too much interpretation and opinion, so it's more like it's objective. But empirical just means you could observe it. Right? You can observe it with the five senses or often with machinery. But even sometimes, even observing something through a microscope requires a certain amount of interpretation. So it's not exactly objective. But sometimes this is why we actually use machines to measure things. A, either we can't, like we can't see infrared light, or B, because it is a little more objective. It helps us to be more empirical uh, less biased. That's kind of the idea of empirical. And data, you know, that can be numbers, but it can also be descriptions. If something is orange, you call it orange. That's actually data. Uh, doesn't have to be a number to be data. Repetition, you hear lots about repeating scientific experiments to have lots of study subjects do things again and again, right? You want a study of thousands of people not one. One is an anecdote, not data. And so we need to repeat experiments to make sure that um, what we're testing is really something that's a trend and not simply a one-time event. That's what science is all about, predictability. If it's predictable, it should happen the same way again and again. But open to scrutiny. Well, that means scientists need to be open with their work, right? It's an open-minded and publish them in journals. So there's lots of scientific journals. It's very different than publishing something online. I mean, that's why we don't trust everything on the internet, right? Um, although there's the joke that it's on the internet, it must be true. We know that's not the case because anybody can put something on the internet. There's no screening. 
In scientific journals, that's the point. You publish something, you publish your work, but before it actually makes it into the journal, it's reviewed by other scientists, usually anonymously, so that they can look over it and make sure that everything looks good, uh, that the methods are sound, that the measurements look right, that they can ask you questions about it. And so there's that sort of skepticism on their part, like, I wonder if that was really done well. And if it passes that panel of people, then it gets published and put out there for everyone to look at, which still means that it's not necessarily right, but other people have looked at it. So we're making sure we put good quality information out there. And then that naturally leads into this last point that it changes with new evidence. Um, somebody else might try to repeat your experiment, again back to repetition, and get different results. And they may have a better explanation uh, than you did. So science should change with information. We shouldn't be stuck back in the dark ages uh, bleeding people in order to heal them, in order to balance the humors. And we've come a long way since then. We need to ditch ideas that don't work and adopt ideas that do. As ideas progress in science, as we become more certain, they kind of graduate from hypothesis to theory. So hypothesis is an explanation that's not really been well tested, whereas a theory has stood the test of time, lots of evidence to support it. So this is a scientist's way of saying it's a sure thing. We're as close to it as we can get, which is almost the opposite of what the common use of the word theory. All of these are built on facts. And so a fact is just a simple observation. No one would dispute it, but it doesn't explain anything. Similarly, laws don't necessarily explain things. They just describe how facts are related. Sometimes that's as a mathematical formula. Several terms that you'll hear throughout this course. Well, doing science is not easy. It's not a natural sort of mode for us to operate in. It requires a lot of discipline. Personally, I think that people are wired to be relational rather than rational, to be loyal rather than empirical. It's just not exactly the way we're built. So it does require a lot of discipline to do science well. It requires us to do other things that we don't naturally do. We have to admit when we're wrong. We have to change our mind as new ideas present themselves. And we have to listen to the data over our own opinions. And that's tough to do. Well, as we wrap up, my question to you is, is science enough? Is it enough to look at the natural world for the questions that we have and seek answers to? When do we need to go beyond science? Or do we at all? I'd love to hear your thoughts on the matter. If you want to leave a question or a comment, I'd welcome to look at it and I'll do my best to respond. Thanks for watching.